Hello and welcome to another episode of Inspiring Women Leaders. Today I'm really excited to welcome to the show my friend and healthcare leader Anne Richardson. Anne is a visionary healthcare administration leader and elite performer known for her strong ethic, integrity and commitment to high quality patient care and clinical program efficiency through a high level of physician and care team engagement. A clinically savvy, trusted partner committed to exceeding expectations, keeping physicians and patients' interests at the centre of decision making and focusing on enhanced value, Anne is able to challenge authority to protect patients and care teams. Anne is a believer in physician and care team advocacy to successfully implement patient-centric advocacy models of care. She has according to herself, small eyes and big ears to uncover countless opportunities for improvement and engagement through a bottoms up systems based approach with the voice of the frontline workers directing and implementing the necessary changes. You can mainly find her on the social media platform LinkedIn. What an incredible mission. I think it's very fair to say that Anne Richardson is leading the way with inspiration. So Without further ado, let's meet Anne Richardson. Welcome to the show, Anne. Thank you so much for agreeing to come on and speak to the show's audience. I am truly honoured that you're here because I know you don't say yes to every podcast invite. So welcome and thank you. That is correct. Thank you so much, Adam. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, I, I kind of um, read out a, a bit of an intro and bio um, that was uh, very inspiring, but, you know, uh, some, somewhat uh, professional and formal and it'd be lovely to hear from yourself in your own words um, you know a bit more about yourself for the audience a bit more kind of humanized um, including what your your current roles are and what leadership positions you hold or have held in the past please. Yeah so thank you for that um, introduction so I have a 25 plus year experience as a healthcare administrator started early in my career and spent uh, several years, more than 15 years in academic medical centers, running and leading large hospital-based departments, as well as medical group from anesthesiology, OBGYN, multi-specialty groups, uh, surgical services, primary care, and so forth. Uh, and from an early, early age, I was always a patient advocate and in fact started off as a nursing student and switched to healthcare administration. Um, and I am a fierce patient advocate and how I advocate for patients is by advocating for the care team, namely the physicians, all the providers, the nurses and so forth. And I'm also naturally a very, uh, inquisitive person and I learn by, uh, visual. So that's what I mean by long before I knew formally what lean was and I subsequently got trained and certified for lean. I was very big in being uh, as what Lean would call on the Gemba. So I'd be in the operating room, I'd be in the ICUs and the various clinical settings so that I could have the big eyes to watch and observe and learn and small mouth so that I could be quiet with big ears and listen and learn. And what it did for me is it allowed me to really be an advocate for the teams because I couldn't touch a patient and jump in and help although times I could do comfort measures and provide, you know, a warm blanket or whatever the case may be. But what it did for me was it established a respectful, engaging relationship with the workforce that they, they knew that I got it. And mm -hmm. they came to uh, expect and request, can you come work with me? Can you shadow with me? Whatever the case may be. Sometimes it was a medical assistant, a nurse or, or whatever the case. So it became part of my job. It became part of my standing operating procedure. And no matter where I went, what I did, uh, wasn't always welcome because some hospitals and some uh, organizations, there's a lot of meetings, which of course I would attend. And sometimes I would be, um, uh, it would be frowned upon because I might have missed a meeting because I needed to tend to a care team for a patient access issue or whatever the case may be. And if I had to choose, the patient always won. So it allowed me to learn so, so much. Uh, so I'm very clinically savvy for that reason. And any area that I uh, would direct and lead, I would just do more research and learn more about it, whether it was oncology or surgery. I would learn everything that I needed to as far as capital equipment and treatment modalities, clinical pathways, navigation, so that I would know what does my team look like that I need to recruit? What do I need to know to speak their language and really be an advocate? So um, I can tell you that it was very successful and the clinical teams really, really appreciated it because yeah. they 
love the fact that I um, learned and respected the work that they did and that most important that they had a voice that they could talk to me and I would listen. I love that. I absolutely love that. And I, I, re- I respect you so hugely for that. Um, and when, when I was speaking to Dr. Amelia Beaky recently, I, we kind of talked about this a bit. Um, you know, I, I really um, value and respect those, those CEOs, those non-clinical CEOs who would go and uh, walk the wards and go down to clinic and meet people and meet all the, the different varieties of staff that work in a hospital, you know, from domestic staff and kitchen staff and, you know, physical therapists, nurses, doctors, go and go and see patients and, and get to know what the patients are like and, you know, kind of do that, do um, a bit of a, a visiting tour once a week or something like that, just so they can see what's going on. Um, and, you know, and it sounds like you were way more hands on than that. So uh, I, I fully get why the clinicians hugely valued you um because i if i worked with someone like you um i would you know massive me massively appreciative of that so um so what's your personal leadership style then when you know how would you describe that kind of engagement that you have well so along the way as you can imagine when you had that style where you you feel like you need and you want to be close to where the care is provided you got a few naysayers along the way who might have said, well, how do you do your job? I'd say, this is my job. So while I had an office and I had a desk and all that, you know, I I say to people, I don't spend a lot of time there. I'm not an armchair manager. I use my office for when I need to do, you know, work in quiet or I need my office for a private conversation Mm -hmm. with with somebody. Um, But most of the time I was out and about. And um, so my style always was engaging with the team and as I say this often, um, is keeping my finger on the pulse on the team who keeps their finger on the pulse of the patient. So I could see things, literally be that outside pair of eyes, even when I it was my job, because you know, when you're a doctor or you're a clinician, you're so focused on what you do day in and day out. And, you know, healthcare, as you know, is a lot of fire drills and very reactive, very proactive. So someone like me prided, I pride myself on trying to be ahead so that I could see things for the team and say, hey, I have an idea, what do you think? Or, hey, let me take care of that. Um, So then if I went back to my office at night, because I had to do the mandatory variance reports, financial budgeting, forecasting, whatever the case may be, I found that so easy because I really knew what was going on. So if somebody had a question for me in leadership, you know, what was going on with the vagary of a schedule or surgical volume, um, I, I... really knew what was going on but sometimes to the ridiculous level of detail because yeah. I am very analytical and detail oriented and I prided myself on that but as you can imagine too in healthcare not every culture is that way so not everybody was comfortable with me because maybe my colleagues really didn't feel comfortable doing that and that's fine I don't criticize them everybody has you know their style but yeah. I would often lead by example in a way that sometimes people from other areas that were subordinate to me would sheepishly come and say, you know, there's something that I'm being charged to do and I don't know how to do it. Would you help me? Yeah. And, and sometimes it was, it was uh, complicated because the person who they reported to at my level, they didn't feel comfortable having that conversation, let's say. Yeah. So I had yeah. to negotiate a way to be able to coach them and help them so that they yeah. could succeed without stepping on somebody's toes, which in healthcare administration, um, there's a lot of egos and there's a lot of, yep. uh, you know, sensitive, sensitive topics. And sometimes that gets in the way of doing what's right for care teams. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. So what I'm, what I'm hearing is that, uh, you know, you're very, very patient focused, patient orientated and, um through you know, you know through association with that and and through wanting the, to do the best for for patients you have you have to be very clinician um centered as well because they're the ones that are actually ha- helping the patient and because as you say um we're just kind of you know firefighting and kind of concentrating on the the nitty-gritty of the situation when you were around you were able to have that overview and that kind of gave you that very visionary kind of style um, because you were aware 
of what was going on. You know, the, the clinicians had the blinkers on and you were able to see the big picture. Yeah, and, and I don't want to oversimplify this, but I'll say this in um, healthcare is very transactional, un unfortunately. And so in the US, we have a fee for service model. And so everything is volume, volume is king. Mm. And so every physician, every provider, everybody is uh, charged with seeing more patients, doing more procedures, you know, produce more, do more surgical cases, whatever the case may yeah. be. But often the infrastructure that the system has put in place, particularly for employed physicians, and I say, you know, more than 70% of physicians in this country are employed. So in those systems, physicians have tremendous pressure to produce, but mm. they often are in systems that sometimes don't deliver on what their contractual obligation was. And what I mean by that, they might not have the proper care team. They may not have the proper clinic space, so they don't have the capacity yeah. to see as many patients. They may not have the OR capacity right now. This has nothing to do with the pandemic, but then add the pandemic to it. Staffing issues, um, you know, in operating rooms in particular and other areas on the inpatient side means that we have a reduction in available nursing. So when you have fewer nurses, you have fewer procedures, uh, fewer patients that can be admitted and so forth. Yeah. But what I would pride myself on doing is I couldn't necessarily fix the big, big problem at the top, let's say, or the external forces such as a reimbursement scheme and the transactional nature of healthcare. But what I would get excited is if I could be part of creating the infrastructure that that team needed. Okay. So let's mm. just say that somebody produced a number. Uh, and you hope that they had a conversation with someone like me and the clinicians to say, okay, how many patients can we see this week, this month, this year, surgeries, whatever, that I would be very vocal and very, very persuasive to talk about what, what does the team look like to be able to produce that? Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that simple, but I can honestly tell you that I've succeeded more times than I've not succeeded on getting that mm -hmm. uh, so that we could meet the demand um, and we could see the number of patients that we needed to see in this transactional world, but it became more palatable because if you have the right complement of players on the team, mm -hmm. then the doctors and nurses and others felt, and nurse practitioners and physician assistants felt like it was more relational because they actually had the right care team, if that makes sense. Yeah. So it was still highly transactional. So to somebody who was looking at volume and numbers, and that person was me as well, I still was part of building out that team for them with their voice to tell me what it was they needed. You know, what do mm -hmm. they need for first assist in the OR, for example, or what does an obstetrician need for support in the in the delivery room as well as in the clinic? And really getting into the weeds and working and knowing what I learned along the way to be able to influence the executive leadership who would say, oh, you know, we, we can't hire any more people, but then it would be demonstrating kind of like, if you build it, they will come. Mm -hmm. And so when you build the team, you, you can actually meet the demand in this transactional world of medicine. And at the same time, you actually uh, can demonstrate safety and quality as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and the team is actually looking at all these transactions and all these visits that they did or whatever their procedure volume was, uh, and I've had this conversation at the end of these clinics and whatnot, and they would smile and they'd be like, oh my God, look how, look how many patients we saw. And they feel proud of the work that they did, Yeah. but they, ha but they had a full complement of members of the team to be able to, everybody had a job, everybody had a role and it flowed. Yeah. So I that's, don't mean to simplify that, but I feel strongly in not just throwing up our hands and saying, well, healthcare is transactional. That's the way it, it is. But it, <laughs> If you have the right mindset and the right people and you allow them to have a voice, um, you can build teams and have yeah. a team based care to be able to make it relation, you know, ba based on relationships with the team and with the patients. Yeah. Yeah. And I'd add to that, you know, um, yourself having having the right kind of leader to facilitate all of this, you know, someone who is compassionate and, uh, you know, extols those kind of servant leadership qualities because i'll i'll bet without even knowing that you rolled your sleeves up and just got stuck in and nothing was kind of too you know below you or anything like that because that's just the kind of person you are um yeah and, and i and like so many people i've worked in places along the way that had limited um physical 
you know, facility space. And so sometimes we were crowded. And if you were in a clinic that was adjacent to a different specialty, you often had physicians, you know, um, bumping into each other and, you know, mm -hmm. somebody took longer with a patient. So sometimes you had to be creative. Those were the places and the times and the days that I would know what the schedule was going to be. So I kind of knew I needed to be there yeah. sometimes yeah. to be traffic cop and not to police it and micromanage, but to actually wear scrubs yeah, and, yeah. Um, and blend in with yeah. the team so that the patients, if they saw me in a suit or a dress, they'd say, oh, you know, some, sometimes they look at it as what's this authoritative figure, something must yeah, be wrong. Yeah. But if you blend in, um, you put the patient's mind at ease as well. Yeah. And, you know, you're yeah. more hands on. And yeah. at the end of the day, it's really about getting the patient's access and keeping things flowing. Yeah, yeah. I love that. I love that. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, okay. So you, you, you gave us a little teaser early on about that you started off uh, studying nursing and then you kind of uh, segued over into um, to the dark side, into healthcare management and, and business and so on. Can, can you tell us kind of how you, how you climbed um, to, to get to quite senior positions? So I, I started off in a BSN program, a four-year program for nursing, and I you know, grew up in a family and had a nurse as a role model and others. And then two years into the program, I discovered I really didn't want to be hands-on clinical. I have no regrets, and I switched to healthcare administration. So I never finished the, I didn't do the clinical part of nursing, and then uh, was in a leadership role and went and got my uh, MBA uh -huh. uh, in the evening. Uh, so I started off, um, you know, in a, like a coordinator type role working at mm -hmm. an academic medical center in Boston, actually, um, and met some great, great people. And the, um, my connections that got me my earlier positions came through internships. And I did internships mm -hmm. in some pretty prestigious academic medical centers in Boston, which um, I um, loved the work that I did, the people that I met, and that helped pave the way for the opportunities from there. And um, so I was very young and early in my leadership positions, I felt like, oh my gosh, like it was almost imposter syndrome. I had this experience and whatnot, but my first big job, I had 250 people that I was overseeing in, in some way, shape or form. And um, in an academic medical center, big residency program and so forth, but I learned a ton. And that yeah. was where I started the journey of, well, I need to look and go see, cause they're asking me questions that I, I you know, I need, and, and it was in an operating room. So I spent um, almost 10 years in that setting and had other leadership roles as well. But um, that, paved the way and proved to me that that was the way that I was going to learn and do things. And yeah. um, I, I actually loved it. Um, I, I loved it very, very much. And again, it allowed me to have engagement with physicians and others, nurses that I didn't direct and they weren't part of my team per se, but mm -hmm. they were because they were part of the team that took care of patients. So I spent a lot of time in the ICU and um, clinics and whatnot in my learning journey. Yeah. But then, um, but I've also done consulting along the way. And mm -hmm. uh, most of that has been informally, not advertising it through my network again. And then in COVID, my position was eliminated from a hospital. And so I did some change management consulting in 2021, where I was on site during the pandemic in hospitals mm -hmm. um, and traveled a bit for that. Um, and I also paused for a little bit because... The challenge I have with consulting when you're not consulting on your own, and what I mean by that is when you're consulting for a consulting firm, let's say, yeah. or yeah. somebody reaches out and says, you know, can you do this assessment project in a hospital, whatever the case may be. I am not a check the box person. I'm a very uh, visionary person. And even if you give me a scope of work, I'm smart enough to know that when I get in there, I'm going to see something a little bit different or maybe a lot different. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk to the doctors, the nurses, patients, everybody, and kind of get a sense of really what the root cause is for some of these things. Yeah. So yeah. I'm challenged when I, if I work with a group and um, often organizations, namely hospitals will hire consultants and they'll have a preconceived set of ideas that they want to implement. They spend a lot of time, yeah. a lot of money 
the consulting firms actually make quite a bit of money doing that. And um, they don't mind going into a hospital and finding things that are out of scope. And then three, two years later, they're still there. And um, I don't fit in well with that because yeah. yep. I have come from the side that's been told we can't afford a nurse. We can't afford, you know, uh, another medical assistant. So I would much rather be the person who goes in and is efficient and is honest and gets into the weeds and listens to the team. Yeah. It gets in and gets out. And yeah. um, so I'm, I'm now doing a little bit of pause. I have a website that I haven't launched yet because it's giving me an opportunity to say, okay, what are my offerings that I really um, can make the most impact? And um, I mentor a lot of physicians who have reached out to me because of my knowledge um, on running medical practices in hospitals, outside of practices, outside of the hospital, contract negotiations, those type of things. And those are the things that I'm passionate about and I enjoy mm -hmm. because while I understand why we have doctors and nurses leaving in droves from the bedside, mm -hmm. I still am very passionate about supporting those that really want to make it work and stay in because at the end of the day, we're all patients too. So um, True. I, I yeah. find myself mentoring nurses and others. Sometimes it's a brainstorming session to talk about what other opportunities uh, they can pursue, you know, given their background. Um, I do recruiting in many ways and networking and introducing people for job opportunities. So, so right now I'm not uh, full-time in a hospital and um, not so sure that I'd want to go back on what I call the inside. On a, on a permanent basis, but I will never say never because there are a lot of great organizations out there doing great work. Um, and if somebody needed somebody like me to come in and help them, um, I would entertain that thought. Cool. I'm, well, I, I, I hope you get lots of <laughs> lots of people approaching you uh, after they've heard this podcast. Um, uh, just kind of going back then to... Um, that that first really quite um meaty and responsible role that you had where you were um you know the kind of line manager for 250 personnel in 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 and around the OR um and that sounds to me like that was the springboard for uh, your kind of subsequent roles and your successes in in leadership um were there any people that you know uh you, you can recall noteworthy either physicians or non-physicians female or male who actually kind of uh, helped you rise um kind of during that time so um it, it was an interesting time because i worked in an academic medical center that went through some difficult financial times and so there was um periods where we had layoffs and we had reduction in force which i was part of uh, at the same time I was always a person that administration would tap to say, these are in my words, if they wanted to try some creative model, they knew I was crazy enough because I'd try anything, like anything to change. Um, and because it was an academic medical center, I uh, was young and enthusiastic and most of my colleagues would roll their eyes and go, oh God, you know, you know, she's new and she's got energy and so forth. So I, I was actually tapped to take on um, when we had um, chairs that retired for large mm -hmm. academic uh, departments. Um, I can think of early in my career, I had this big job, but then they said, would I do an interim in addition to, because mm -hmm. I had an academic chair that needed somebody like me to help him. Cause while he was an amazing physician, he had never been in a leadership position and he needed somebody to coach him and to guide him. Mm -hmm. So early in my career, I was doing that, but but I, between the two hospitals and the two, one was OBGYN, one was anesthesiology, um, I was in eight hospitals. Yeah. And so I was spread pretty thin and the agreement was uh, the two chairs were like, okay, we'll allow you to you know, take her and spread her thin, but are you gonna give her a team? And of course they said they were, but they didn't uh, because yeah. they couldn't yeah. afford it. So I did the craziness. Um, but out of that, I had some amazing physicians uh, amazing nurses, amazing, you know, clinicians in general, I'll just say, um, who were incredibly supportive. And, you know, today we talk a lot about the dyad model, which I'm not a big fan of, because that's aligning a physician with an administrator. 
Whereas I always like a triad because I always had a physician leader, me on the administrative side and a nurse leader. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so yeah. to me, uh, I defy you to find something in healthcare where you don't have nursing as part of that. And that's part of the, why we're where we are today is because they've often left the voice of a nurse out of the conversation. So yeah, so I had some great leaders um, and many of them were women and one in my early career um, was a very uh, strong woman leader physician. And um, she, like so many of us was silenced. And even at a young age, I took on the administration uh, on that because we were trying to develop a program. And um, mm -hmm. there was some uh, very strong male chairman that you didn't want it. And I went to the president and CEO of the hospital and did a very strong case on why we needed to have this clinical program because we were losing patients out of a system and it wasn't right for patient access. Um, and the bottom line is we went to the board, we got it approved. So that started my journey. I was very polite and appropriate, but if you do your homework and do your due diligence, mm. um, you know, and I'm a big fan of, if you don't ask, you'll never get a yes. So it's yeah. how you yeah. ask and you must ask, but, um, but along the way, I suffered some abuse because um, people prefer, you know, that you not, you know, speak up and yeah. they prefer people to be uh, quiet. I um, definitely endured uh, bullying at, at the highest level, uh, threats, you know, sexual harassment, uh, physical abuse, all kinds, all kinds. But when you're young, and you're making your way in a leadership position and you're a woman, uh, you, you really um, are at risk. And, um, and it's, it hasn't changed too, too much, but you're yeah. pretty much dominated by males in uh, academic medicine and healthcare leadership. I worked very closely with the dean's office. They were all males and they were um, incredibly toxic, incredibly yeah. toxic, incredibly threatening. Um, and bullies is like it's not even enough of a powerful word to describe yeah. some of the people that I um that I I say I survived but but it was it was very 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 difficult very difficult yeah, yeah. I can I mean we, we've spoken before at length and and uh and I, I, I can hear, I can hear some of the, you know, you, you carry, you carry some of this trauma with you. Uh, I can hear it in your voice, you know, uh, it's hard to forget these things, isn't it? From, you know, my experiences, I can't remember always the exact words that were used or the exact actions or, you know, but I can remember very strongly remember how, how I felt and, and it's those feelings that come rushing back when you're, like, for example, when I was tutoring Indigenous students in in Australia, in Darwin, and they were telling me their stories, that's when things came flooding back to me. So I can I can I can hear the emotion in your in your voice. I don't want to um, delve too much and kind of um, uh, cause you to become upset. But is, is there is there a, an example that you could um, talk about? Um, maybe not too much detail, but that there was a good lesson there that you could advise the kind of aspiring uh, leader listeners how to navigate a certain situation? Well, so I'll say this, like I said, um, I believe in respectful dissent. And when you're in healthcare, often the um, challenges that we're faced with can usually be tied back to patient care or access, safety, quality. In my case, it always was, right? So when I would challenge authority, I would um, do it in a respectful manner in a private place. And sometimes it was the chair of the department. And I, you know, the dean's office would say to me, uh, that's a tenured professor, we can't touch him, but we know you're correct. And you know, we were dealing with a very difficult situation where there were risks that were happening in the operating room and how we were staffing and with whom we were staffing and a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of issues, but I was persistent because um, bad things were happening. We had bad patient outcomes. We had, uh, we actually had sentinel events that were investigated. Um, and then I was told, well, you're not a clinician. What do you care? And I'm thinking, oh, gee, you know, I'm a patient advocate. Why wouldn't I care? And yeah. then uh, I could be a patient here too. So, so I do, I do feel that 
uh, bringing up um, concerns of safety and quality, I have no regrets. Um, and you know, you I, again, you don't do the nine one one, you don't embarrass people, and you don't do things publicly. But you find a forum to bring it up, and you persist. Um, yeah. And it is doing the right thing. And um, but then on the other hand, you know, I saw things and, and suffered consequences of being threatened because people didn't like uh, you to bring certain things up. So I had an example um, where um, after eight and a half years of persisting on some things that, um, you know, you definitely lost sleep at night, Yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, being told by the executives that you need to, um, and I don't talk about this and I don't write about it, but I'll share this with you. You need to back up the computer and save the receipts, so to speak, because, you know, you're, you're pressing buttons and bringing up things that people don't, you know, because everybody likes to cover up and look the other way. And um, you need to be able to protect yourself because you could be harassed and accused of things to either get you terminated or to break you so that you leave. Yeah. Yeah. And when you're up against a tenured professor in academic medicine, um, you know, I, I'm curious to know what it would take to, to have them disciplined or to be terminated or whatever the case may be. So, yeah. so that I, so that I, you know, had to be hypervigilant with everything that I wrote and everything that I typed, you know, putting everything in an email to my home or bringing stacks and stacks of documents home with me. Um, some that I can tell you I still carry with me today. I've moved out of state and sold homes and people joke with me and they're like, but that banker's not box never goes anywhere because I just never know. I just never know, you know, when I may need certain things. Um, and, um, and then over time, you know, th those people moved on and I'm sad to admit that they moved on and were promoted to even bigger, more prestigious positions. And, um, and everybody, you know, signed NDAs and were silenced because, you know, you can't, you, you can't go there and yeah. particularly in academic medicine, yeah. with very, very powerful people. And you'd have people behind closed doors who would apologize and they'd admit to the various things, but sorry, we can't do anything. And I was yeah. actually told by the executives in the dean's office of a, of a medical school to save your sanity maybe you should look and do something else because we're so sorry we can't help you because these people they're tenured and um so i'm sure you've heard that story from others but uh i say this with you because there's a lot of women in medicine and in academic medicine who still suffer today and have suffered for decades but i share that because people in administration suffer as well yeah yeah Very so. yeah and yeah there is uh often um a kind of us us versus them of of kind of physicians versus administrators and it's it's very um it's very heartening that i've had a couple of um a couple of guests that i've interviewed um already who have have talked about the kind of um you know, kind of sympathetic and em empathic interaction with with administration staff, and uh, you know, kind of meeting meeting halfway and and kind of understanding on both sides. And um, it's 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 refreshing to hear uh, some of the people I've some of the physicians I've interviewed um, take that take that line. You know, rather than you know, oh the you know effing administration or what you know there's a lot of there's a lot of you know kind of uh, dislike for for administration there but they they haven't worked with people like you that's the thing well but as you can imagine in that scenario that i described um and and you know today it's always us against them and and that yeah i again even though i wore the leadership administrative hat i still would always say I'm on the team of the patients. So if that meant I was on the team yeah. with physicians and the care team, it makes sense, right? But yeah. then I would always say to leadership who who would say to me, why do you care so much? I mean, I, I could write a book about the crazy things that have been said to me. You're not a clinician. Why do you advocate so much for the patient? Or, you know, why do you care so much mm -hmm. about nurses and doctors? And 
the colorful things that I've said, because I'm not shy that I've said to some of those people, it's like, are you, that's just like crazy. Yeah. Um, but then on the other hand, if you challenge a physician who's behaving poorly and putting a patient at risk, then you all of a sudden become, you know, us against them. Then all of a sudden yeah. I become the administrator. And then I'd say to them, look at, I'm advocating for you and for the patient, but you know, we need to not be doing you know, and I'd say yeah. we, even though it wasn't me, because I yeah. didn't want to be accusatory and I'd make myself part of how we staffed or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And would do it in a very discreet, private manner, almost desperate because I was so afraid for the patient. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and again, um, but then when you see, you know, events happen, um, and, and I'll share this too, because I've written about it on LinkedIn is having somebody say to me, yeah, you're right. I know, but it's good enough for the poor people that live in this city. You know, um, the double standard of having a set of standards for people that um, maybe English wasn't their first language or, yeah. you know, they came from a, a demographic that they felt they were so grateful to have this tertiary care that they wouldn't dare question. Yeah, yeah. Um, that. I've shared that with many people and people tell me they, they've heard that. Like I, nobody yeah. is shocked by that story because they say they hear it all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I can. Um, yeah. I can re- relate to that. Not, not personally, but um, you know, I have lots of um, people of color, physician friends who, uh, you know, talk about people in their communities that they serve um, where there's, there's willful, willful neglect, um, and you know you only have to you only have to look at the the pandemic and the you know which demographics suffered the highest mortality rates you know to very clearly demonstrate there's a there's a two tier system in Western medicine uh, not just in the US but very very commonly in the UK as well. Um, but uh, yeah, thank you for for all of that. I mean, uh, it, it, the, the the situation you describe of of you know. Uh, the, the tenured professor male, male um, I think you said, and you know, you're a, a female administration leader. You have you have no chance against a, a male professor, do you? Uh, it's just 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 the way it is. Uh, uh, certainly, ho- hopefully, maybe slightly less so now, but uh, maybe maybe not very much. Um, but the the way you describe it, almost like you you had to watch your back and it's like in a way you're still watching your back you still have kept evidence of certain of certain things um just just in case someone just comes knocking at your door one day i mean that's that's pretty heavy stuff and you know that's uh that's yeah that's, I, that's, I can't say too much but i mean, no, I of mean course. when i say that yeah. the the threats that some of us have endured um yeah yeah. You know, early in your career or, you know, 10 years into your career, it's a threat of not working. It's a threat of losing your job. It's a threat yeah. of, um, you know, where will you go next? Um, yeah. That that particular organization I stayed at for almost 11 years and left on my own. And as I was trying to leave, a new CEO came in. And this I'll share is interesting. He's three weeks into his job. You know, and this is a, you know, more than a billion dollar organization at that point mm. in time. And I got a heads up call. So-and-so is coming to see you. He's on his way. I said, why is he coming to see me? He said, oh, he wants to talk to you. So, you know, I'm savvy enough to know something's up with this. Why would a CEO of this huge organization come into my office and sit, as I would say, in my guest chair? He sat for over two hours because he heard as he said, oh, that I was great, that I was looking to leave. And he was coming to um, talk to me about staying. And I said, no, thank you. And he said, well, I'm a CEO and I'm asking you to stay. Do you want to think about that for a minute? And I said, no, would you like me to repeat it? I'm leaving. (laughs) And he said, where are you going? I said, I don't know anywhere but here, but I need to save myself. And he got very persistent about you know trying to be charismatic and getting me to stay and I said you know what I'm not going to share with you my journey here um I said but I I I don't really want to explain it to you I said but I just know that I need to go and um he wouldn't take no for an answer and he said you know um both of us are attending such and such an event I'm going to come see you in the morning well he persisted for days (laughs) 
until finally uh, he talked me into going to work for him directly. And um, I had a highly compensated job in a glass window C-suite office, no title, no duties. It was all about um, the statute of limitations, you know, running down the clock. Let's keep her quiet and watch her. Right. And, right. And I was uncomfortable and I confronted her and I said, you know, I've laid off more people than I've hired in any given year. And um, I don't feel right being paid. Not, I said, there's so many jobs out there so that I should be doing this isn't right. And he wouldn't admit what he was doing. So, um, but I was also insulted by busy work. So yeah, I went to yeah, work yeah. for the chief financial officer and I actually was doing some great meaningful projects. It was, it was terrific. Um, but I was uncomfortable with being watched. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they all, then they eventually worked up the courage once they felt they built a relationship with me to ask for the receipts. They asked me, they said, we know you have documents. I mean, this is an academic medical center. Would you share them with us? And I said, absolutely not. And the same CEO said, he goes, you realize I'm the CEO. I said, I don't really care if you're the Pope. I am not giving you, you know, 10 years worth of what I've, you know, endured and suffered. And you're the new CEO. I don't really care. Walk in my shoes and then maybe you'll understand, but I am absolutely not giving you that, yeah. that information. Yeah. Um, and I never did. And I left. And I had uh, newspapers and this is in the Boston market calling me. I had all kinds of people calling me and whatnot because people were dropping the dime, so to speak. And I wasn't and I never spoke. I refused to give anybody in from any information. Um, and I was on I was so honest. I actually shared with the CEO that I was being contacted by some of the big media outlets. I said, I just want you to know that somebody's tipped them off. Um, and uh, he said, thank you for telling me. And of course I never spoke to anyone to this day, but, um, but so much goes on. It yeah. still goes on. Yeah. It still yeah. goes on. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I saw it last year. I, I hear it every day in, in yeah. the stories that I hear. So um, we haven't gotten much better. No, no. But what, what uh, seems to be, for me anyway, listening to you, a pervasive theme of um, what's kind of got you through, and correct me if I'm wrong, I think you have very strong values mm. and I think you are very values driven. And I think you've probably just clung onto those values through through thick and thin. And that's what's kind of enabled you to cope and, and move move past some of these awful awful situations well that and also it's, it's probably not the healthiest thing but i the coping me mechanisms i learned was just to you know put it away shelve it and just move on and then when you're working in healthcare in a hospital setting and, and even when i was managing 22 practices in a multidisciplinary you know leadership role um you know owned by a hospital system, you had a lot of uh, people that you were responsible for, whether they were doctors, mm -hmm. nurses, patients, whatever the case may be. So I, I could go through the most worst difficult situation in the world, even in a given day, but if we end up running a good clinic and our OIs were running and people were happy, um, I was happy. And so, you know, getting the results and being part of achieving those results yeah. was what drove me. And it was never about me. And, and it wasn't, it allowed me to survive, but it, not just survive, but actually to thrive and do well. But right. what I've been told along the way is that I didn't, you know, deal with some of those other, you know, abuses and whatnot. And I just, not that I shrugged it off that it was no big deal, but I just had to land on my feet and keep going. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I do speak up. Like I said, I, I, yeah. I don't, um, I'm not so resilient that I'm going to watch, you know, or, or listen to bad behavior and somebody be yeah. abused, whether it's a coworker or a patient and yeah. not say something. Yeah. And um, that whole see something, say something. I wrote about this recently. I said, how come it happens with, you know, child abuse and it happens with animal abuse. But when it comes to 
patients in healthcare, I mean, um, see something, say something. If you report it, you could lose your job. Yeah. Or you go to jail and be arrested. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the consequences can be really grim if you speak yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I'm just, yeah, again, I'm hearing, you know, it was just a, an in, incredible lack of ego that, that you had. You know, you, 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 you put the, the patient journey and uh, the clinical um, tasks that day to the front of your mind. And um, it, it just, it, it so wasn't about you. Um, and right. that, that actually enabled you to, to thrive in really quite harrowing circumstances, I think, at times. So. Well, and I think, and this is what I say too, I talk to a lot of physicians and others. Um, I write about this as well, is that we have a lot of amazing leaders out there in healthcare today um, that maybe don't feel like they're leading well, and maybe they're not perceived that they're succeeding because they're just so paralyzed by the chaos, right? Mm -hmm. And maybe once upon a time before the pandemic, things were, you know, maybe it was a well-oiled machine. I don't know. Maybe I'm giving too much credit to the industry, but I don't want to make it sound like everybody in leadership is, is inept or they're, you know, they're driven by their egos and whatnot, because there's a lot of good people out there. But what I have always had the ability to do and I feel good about is not blame and just go in and unless it's really egregious, just put that history behind us and just, if nothing else, and I've talked to doctors about this, is that if you hit these CEOs between the eyes, like, oh, we need help, you're not doing this, you back them into a corner and they feel that uh, they get they get very um, defensive, appropriately mm-hmm. so. But if you just meet people halfway, partner with them, engage with them, and give them a few ideas of solutions and bring yeah. them along with you, um, I, I just think yeah. the results are that much better. It's not like you're going to yeah. have change overnight, but if you take small chunks and it's all in the words, words matter. And I, yeah. and I think that if we do a better job at um, forgiving and putting the past behind us, and people have heard me say that knowing the real details of my story. And they're like, how do you do that? And I said, I had to, I had to find a coping mechanism and survive. And yeah. when you work in healthcare, um, Patients don't want to hear your sorry ass story or, no, or you can't no, share no. it with the staff. You need to, you need to perform for them and you need to be yeah, there. For yeah. Them. So yeah, yeah, I would yeah. say that um, despite all of what I've gone through, I have so many more success stories and results um, yeah. by being that kind of a person with teams that, um, that I'm, I, I'm happy and I yeah. celebrate that. And I know that it can be done if you're in with the right mindset of people, just, you know, one little incremental change at a time, if you could just get people to meet you halfway and to listen, yeah, you know, put yeah. some of that history behind us and just clean the slate and just say, okay, what can we do? Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. Um, well, I, You've, you brought us nicely back back onto a slightly more positive trajectory, having gone down a, a, a slightly dark rabbit hole temporarily there for a, for a while. So I, I'll come on to the the next question, which is uh, which is more more positive. So I think that was fantastic advice that you've given us on on how to navigate some of those workplace challenges. Do you have any other advice um, on on how our listeners could become strong, kind leaders? Which I have no doubt that you you are. So, um, so the word I use often is consistency. So what you hear a lot about today, especially in the pandemic, you, you know, you saw it in the media and social media um, about, you know, leaders now coming around and doing rounding. And there's a lot of mockery and negativity towards, you know, oh, they give us pizza or they, you know, have a, you know, ice cream Sunday party. We don't want that. We don't want that. And I understand why they're critic, critic, you know, critical of that is because, so many of them I know, and so many say to me, where have they been all these years? And so what what people want, just because someone's a top-notch physician, surgeon, nurse, they're all human beings. And please, please, please remember that everybody's human. Um, When you have a high volume service in your hospital or in your system, um, I said this to a CEO not too long ago, stop treating this surgeon as as a ATM machine and a cash cow, they're a human being. And if they stop producing because they say I've had enough or I'm sick or I'm tired or I'm going to go elsewhere, 
what are you going to do then? So, so I would just say that um, consistency, lead with consistency and lead with your heart and be, yeah. have empathy and compassion. And I am that person and it comes across that way. It's very authentic. Um, I've worked with teams that people as a new leader would say, oh, this team's tough. It's going to take them a time to warm up to. And they warm up in a day. Yeah. Not because I did anything like, you know, I, I, I don't know, didn't, didn't do anything special. It was just me being me and listening to them and listening is key. Yeah. Key. Absolutely key. I think, I think that, I think that is special though. And it does make you special. Um, despite it being uh, something that seems so obvious or so simple to do because so many people don't do it or they don't do it well um or effectively or appropriately um and i think that is what what sets you a, sets you apart um so thank well, you for being that. approachable yeah yeah accessible. yeah and in this day and age if somebody you know there were times that even with a cell phone i'd still have a page or whether it was a page or a text message or call it was being available you know to yeah. people and they knew that yeah. you were going to be there to the extent that i rounded um all the time multiple times a day. Um, and if I missed a morning round and it wasn't like scheduled, I would get a text message or somebody, are you okay? You here today? Why? Well, you didn't come this morning. We look forward to it. Yeah. And, and part of that uh, was born out of overseeing a large academic um, anesthesiology department that was OR based primarily. Right. I learned to go to them because I was, yeah. my office was in the medical school. So for them to come to me was crazy. So yeah. I always learn, go where your people are to yeah, save that yeah. time. Yeah. Because I'm an office, I'm an admin, so I don't yeah. have to have care responsibilities. So my time is where, and I'm going to be wherever they need me to be, if that yeah. makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So visible, accessible, approachable, and, and listening and using good language and, and, and good communication skills. Thank you. So... I, well, I'm going to add one more thing to that, though, is um, yeah, uh, we're always learning every day, right? But um, especially early in my career, but I still today do your research, do your homework. And one of the many compliments I had uh, from a doctor once was I can take no from you because I know you're not saying no just because you're an administrator. You're saying no because you actually did your homework. And it wouldn't just be a no. It would be no, not now. And then you give me a solution of how we could work towards getting to a yes. Yeah. Uh, there's a big difference. There's a lot of people today, doctors and others who, you know, they don't, they don't even bother going to people in administration because they're so sick and tired of hearing no, sorry, or, yeah. you know, and, and they don't really have solutions and answers that doctors give up. So I've actually counseled a lot of doctors how to have that conversation. Yeah. And, and I said, I don't ever tell somebody to dummy yourself down and go in and pretend like you don't know because you do know, but maybe present it in such a way that gives them credit because some yeah. of these egos want all the credit. So if it makes it any easier or palatable, just lay it out and deliver it to them on a, you know, silver yeah. platter. maybe they'll agree to it and give them all the credit, but yeah, it, it's sad to say, but it's a little finessing in a dance we always have to do, but I don't know. It was something that you just, you just do because you want, you want the end result. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sounds a bit like make, making making it seem like it was a, making them seem uh that it was their idea kind of thing <laughs> and then they agreed to i i Re reverse really, gaslighting really good at that <laughs> i i if all words matter i'd use things like i would know something oh my god i unclad what what the answer was but i'd couch it like oh i perceive what do you think because you'd bring them yeah. along and you'd plant little things along the way yeah. So that they could have the aha moment when you already did your homework and you knew exactly yeah. what needed to be done, but you let them, you bring them along and let them take the credit because yeah. they needed that. And I didn't care because as long as it got us what we needed, I could care less. Just, just give yeah. it to me. Listen. Yeah. The patient, the patient kind of um, benefits from it um, and the team in turn. Right. All you're doing is all you're doing is influencing and, and persuading people, which is uh, a, a very important leadership skill in itself. So, yeah, yes. no, I I I've, I support that very strongly. Um, do do you have any um, any take home leadership messages for the 
listeners i mean you've given us so many i think i've used up all your nuggets <laughs> but if you if you kept any back in reserve well so i mean again i i pride myself on being um authentic and listening is really really important um i know what i know i know what i don't know and so i'm, I'm just to be inquisitive and i think people want to know that you care that you authentically care about yeah. them as people um and you know from the first day you enter into an engagement whether it's consulting or it's your you know your permanent role is is spending the time to build those relationships and getting to know people and if you do it right and you make yourself accessible and you're consistent um you can learn so much as long as you have the dialogue and the communication yeah. um but the challenge is is if you work in an organization where i have where i would have leaders and human resources and others and say, oh my gosh, you know, you have the best employee engagement scores or, you know, we, we wish everybody. And I would kind of say, well, that's great, but why don't you require this of others? Like, in other words, if you bring somebody in or you have somebody that's been there for a long time and um, they don't treat their employees well and this toxicity and abuse, that's why when we talk a lot about abuse um, and bullying and whatnot, it starts at the top. And yeah. if you happen to have a new executive team that comes in and inherits that culture, well, then the buck still stops with them. They must do something about it. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I feel strongly that we treat people with respect and we give people a voice and, um, and you get it back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, um, great that you brought up uh, sort of organizational culture and, and toxic cultures uh, there, but it, it sounds to me like, whenever you had your dealings with people in your, in your team or your um, you know, the kind of the clinical area that you're responsible for, it sounds to me like you, you brought your own culture with you. So right. whatever the, whatever the overarching culture of the organization was, all, all of you working in your own areas and departments and so on, you, you can, you don't have to, follow that toxic culture you can bring your own culture of kindness with you and you know that's that's what i'm hearing you it's i i, I see it as like an aura around you that you brought into those those interactions yeah and i mean um the byproduct of that would be i'd be in places that were difficult they had a hard time recruiting whereas i didn't because either i knew i you know, would network. So I would know how to use my network to whether it was a nurse practitioner, a PA, whatever the case may be. Um, but I've even had people once I got known in a hospital in a very short period of time in, in areas, um, I think of a story recently, and the person said, I, I want to come work for you. Do you have a role? And I, and I, at the time I really didn't. And I said, why? She said, because I know how you treat me. And so many other leaders don't treat me and, and our people really well. And I want to come work with you because mm. I hear great things about how you treat people and I'll learn, I'll study, I'll do whatever, but would you find me a job? And um, I would get that routinely. Mm. And, um, and, and then honestly, if I would interview people and I couldn't hire all the candidates, let's say, I would try to do a really kind handoff with them and work with human resources and try to get them a job in an area where I knew they were going to be treated well, because a lot of my colleagues didn't treat people well, and I did not want these people to suffer anymore. Yeah. Um, but at times I'd be criticized. Oh, you care too much. And then it's like, oh, geez, we're in healthcare. Why shouldn't we want uh, <laughs> workforce to be treated with respect and care and, yeah. uh, and so forth. So yeah. I, yeah, I'm very, I'm very, very, very passionate about that. Yeah, I can I can tell, and I love that. I really do. Oh, I my head is just kind of full of all the richness of of the things that you've told me. So um, I'm not even going to try and kind of pick out pick out things. It's the the, the listeners can can go back and listen to those questions. Um, I'm just going to move on now as we as we come to a close. Um, just want to ask what you're currently excited to be working on that you'd like to share with the listeners. So as I said, my position was downsized uh, with COVID and I've been doing some consulting. Some of the consulting work that I've actually done, which allows me to be remote, is some advisory work with I've done uh, for some healthcare startups and innovation companies. Um, and that it, it excites me uh, to a point, um, but it's uh, not enough to keep me going. 
and I have been doing some uh, mentoring and a little bit of coaching work. That's my puppies. Sorry. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, but, but as I mentioned before, I actually um, started a creative book writing course through Georgetown University in recent weeks. Um, and for someone who thought I wasn't a writer, I want to write a book or two. I was introduced to that program actually through some physicians through LinkedIn who went through that journey and inspired me and wanted me to join and I wasn't ready. So uh, stay tuned for that. And um, it's very, very exciting. Um, but I'm also um, focusing on launching my website uh, to more formally announce some of the work that I am excited and I'm passionate about because some of it I'm doing right now informally, but I want to more formally get that word out. Um, I am not actively looking to go back into a hospital proper per se, but I have lots of conversations with people about some of the work that can be done. I'm passionate about systems-based transformation work from the bottoms up. Again, most of those engagements, I would prefer to be on site and that involves, you know, significant travel. So those are the conversations that I'm having right now, but that the, the transformation work with care teams is what I'm truly passionate about. Yeah, yeah. I, I for one, am um, stupidly excited about your uh, the prospect of your book coming onto onto shelves um, or books. Um, so I'm really going to be watching that space. Um, and uh, it's great, great that you're um, you know getting you getting everything kind of formalized. And uh, I mean, I, th I, th I've said to you before. I think from from my point of view, uh, you have so. There are so many physicians out there that need that need help uh, along the lines that you could offer the kind of mentorship and consultancy. Um, I, th I think you you've been an asset to individual clients and and organisational clients. So um, thank you for that. So um, if any of the listeners would like to reach out to you, and I hope they will, um, what's the best way for them to do so? So LinkedIn is is the best way, and my LinkedIn has my email address. Um... And right now I'm limited on social media intentionally, but LinkedIn is mm. the best place to reach me. And my email address is on there. Um, yeah. And I'm very responsive. I'm, I'm yeah. very, very, very active on LinkedIn of lately. You, you, you really are. And uh, yeah, it's uh, your handle is Anne M Richardson. And uh, I would urge anyone who wants to learn ridiculous amounts about things that go on in in healthcare administration and 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 leadership to follow follow you and look at your posts i was um you know kind of kind of obsessed with with the uh, the posts that you wrote because they are just so incredibly well written and uh certainly i was i was one of the people that, that sort of said to you uh, yeah, you're going to turn these into a book or what? Because they they are phenomenal, phenomenal. So it's a, a a very worthwhile investment in time to to have a little mooch around your LinkedIn profile for sure. Thank you for that. Um, Appreciate that. No, no, no. I really, really mean that, and I, you know that I've told you that before. Um, lovely. So just just to close, then, do you have any any final words that you'd like to share with the listeners? Um, so one of, one of the things that I really appreciate is here I am in the US and you're in the UK and England and <laughs> I have met um, so many people globally so I have conversations mm -hmm. with people in Australia and New Zealand, Europe, UK, Canada, uh, South Africa, yeah, you name it and interesting that in healthcare that's the common thread but that while most of these countries that I have interactions with various professionals and socialized medicine throughout the world, um, one of the common themes that we have, sadly, is the, the toxicity and the challenges we have with the culture. Uh, and that is what is the common thread that brings us all together. Because yeah. while you know the government controls healthcare in so many countries outside of the US, uh, we, we have a problem with that. And yeah. uh, how we engage our workforce and how leaders lead and so yeah. that's where I get invited to have conversations because um, what's what's been my experience and how do I lead the workforce um, from my past and present? Yeah. Well, absolutely. I mean, um, 
it, it is ubiquitous. It doesn't matter uh, where you are in the world and what the, the model of the sort of Western medical um, tradition uh, that's being adopted is, whether it's a sort of private income based one like in the States or a state funded one like in the UK, the toxicity is is very real. It's there regardless. Um, so, yeah, for sure. Um, it is that that uniting thread. So. But it's a way for us to come together, isn't it? And 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 well, do it our is, bit. and that's yeah, right. Because that's why I bring it up is because there's no easy answer. But the more we talk about it, and and yeah. I always yeah. say the first step to solving some of these challenges is creating and increasing awareness. Yeah. And so we're actually increasing awareness globally because yeah. we can learn from different cultures, and and you know you can't say well that happens in that country. We can't learn. We can all learn the voices collectively that are coming together around the world is impressive. Yeah. It's very yeah. impressive. I can't, I, I've met so many amazing people and I've learned so, so much, so, yeah. so much, from so many people. And I value well, that. Greatly. Yeah. I've learned a lot from you and, uh, and, and I know other people will. So it's been a breathtaking conversation. Thank you. Thank you so Likewise. much again. Thank you. For, Thank you oh gosh. Thank Welcome you for back. coming on the show. <laughs> I, I hope back. so. <laughs> after the after the books yeah we'll, we'll talk about the books um thanks so much for sharing all your your wisdom and really incredible advice with us and um thank you to the to the audience for for listening and um yeah i'll i'll be in touch with you soon Anne. and thank you adam yeah my pleasure and until the next episode in two weeks i wish everyone health happiness and inspiring leadership take care <laughs>